I'll tell you, this is great to see everybody this morning, and and uh, this is a real privilege for me. Uh, there's uh, no one that I respect, and I think all of us would share this period uh, than, than Cal Turner, and uh, we know his career at uh, Dollar General, and as he's uh, succeeded his father as president and then chairman, and when he retired in 2002, a company with six billion dollars in sales, that I think as important, and I think he would say that as the great business success was the culture that he built and uh, the culture of caring for his employees and caring for his customers and, and the fact that their foundation was was so focused on benefiting the customers that, that built their success. Uh, for uh, many years he's not better known but in the community certainly known as, as one of our major philanthropists and as, uh, as chairman of his, of his foundation and uh, but what I uh, know and respect most is that he's a man of character, a man of deep faith, a man who cares, a man who helps make things happen oftentimes behind the scenes. So we're just thrilled to get inside. We're going to have a, about a 30-minute conversation and uh, I'm going to ask a few questions and and uh, Cal may or may, may or may not answer them. <laughs> <laughs> or he, he, uh, but we're just delighted to appreciate it very much, Cal, you're being here and, and a chance to have a conversation and the first question I'd just love to know, uh, you know you're, you're, you're so generous with your time and your knowledge and your, your financial resources and your family is how did that happen was it your parents was it growing up Methodist Church the um, not wearing clothes at the Y what <laughs> what, 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 what made you uh, who you are in terms of your giving and financial you can't have grown up in, okay. you can't have grown up in Scottsville, Kentucky um, as a member of the Turner family, four kids, a loving mother and father, a community that helped her raise you. They're, they're, rear you, I guess is more appropriate. But there have been love investments made in me since I was born. And it's just, I'm, I'm defined by uh, my small town upbringing, by having um, mature and affirming parents, by my faith in Jesus Christ. And yet, I got into philanthropy for a selfish reason. About 25 years ago now, um, I learned how much of my estate would pay taxes when I died. And I thought, that is the pits. <laughs> I want to see how that is going to be employed. I want the fun of investing that, as much of that as I can, now. Um, I don't I guess I'm saying I wouldn't trust how anybody would spend it after I'm gone. <laughs> but I wanted the I wanted the fun of it. And it has been fun for me to make investments uh, as opportunity to invest has come along. Now I've I've done some I've been a part of some surprising things. Uh, Lindsay Wilson College was mentioned. Uh, that's a small Methodist school in Kentucky that was about to be shuttered by the conference because it was really dead flat broke. And somehow um, I got coaxed onto that board because uh, the new president of the college knew how to merchandise pitiful. <laughs> you have never seen anybody able 
to get you to feel so sorry for him even before he made an ask. <laughs> well, I got on this board with a bunch of Methodist preachers and they had never raised any money at all. It was, I was amazed um, how backward they were. And God, I'm convinced to this day, spoke to me in our board meeting with a two-part instruction. Now, God doesn't talk to Methodists that often. <laughs> so, so, so when she speaks, we listen. <laughs> two-part instruction. Now, let me put this in context. Dollar General hadn't gotten started uh, performing as a stock. It was just, it was just very sleepy. And Cal, you will give a million dollars to Lindsay Wilson College, and you will announce it today, so you're committed. And. I said, I have an announcement, and I said, I will give a million dollars to Lindsey Wilson College. <laughs> Everybody's mouth dropped open, including mine. <laughs> now, let me tell you what I saw happen. As I told you, the company hadn't gotten started. Lindsey Wilson did something very foolish with the Dollar General stock that I transferred to them. Just put it aside. Didn't do a thing with it. It didn't pay much dividend. And about, oh, 15 years later, I persuaded them to go on and sell the stock and let that benefit the college. And it became over a $20 million endowment. They, um, and isn't that a wow? Mm -hmm. Now, that's, that's not something that, that I did. It's something that happened that I was a part of. And when you have that kind of opportunity in philanthropy, you are blessed. You are blessed. And so I think you are making the offer of blessing to anyone who can really partner with you in the mission and purpose that you're a part of, and you, you don't need to be backward in your ask. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Cal. Uh, when, you, when you make a gift to the Lindsey Wilson or whatever the organization might be, uh, how do you know, at what point do you know that, or that feeling that you've made a good investment? Is it, uh, how do you, make the decision that that money was well spent? Well, I try not to be concerned about that at the time of making the gift. Um, I'm concerned about that ahead of making the gift. Um, and I'm concerned about my stewardship and the challenge of my being faithful to all the blessings that I have, um, I have never, of the many, many persons I've met, ever met a single person whom I consider equally blessed as Cal Turner, Jr. And my <laughs> objective is to be faithful um, to look for um, mission that I identify with 
in a philanthropic opportunity to consider that the Turner family wealth comes from serving the struggling constituency of Dollar General, <clears throat> people who have a hard time making ends meet. How can their life be bettered? And what is the greatest opportunity for me to be a part of their having a better life. And then um, it's your responsibility and others that the investment be well made. My responsibility is on the, the front end discernment. Thank you. And what what be two or three of the key things as you're discerning? You mentioned the, the mission and the values. Any other things that come to the forefront when you're making that discernment? Well, <clears throat> I think the greatest um, issue in society um, boils down to leadership. Um, I spent my career at Dollar General trying to figure out how to get an organization from the entrepreneurial chaos of our founder, my father, to um, a reasonably well-managed and then a well-led company. Now, leadership is about drawing the best from everyone. It's listening to others, loving others, and I'll, how well an organization is led is an important consideration to the gift. Um, we find many big hearts out there that might not be able to manage their way out of a paper bag. Um, and, and that might be okay. If, if the heart is big enough, the mission is big enough, and with, philanth with our philanthropy, perhaps there could be a little bit of coaching about the leadership agenda of that organization. So philanthropy isn't just um, saying yes. Sometimes it's saying no. It isn't just giving money. Um, it, 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 you, whatever you have to offer, whatever you can bring to the table to help an organization to pursue its mission better, is, is a part of your agenda as a philanthropist. Um, what does philanthropy mean? The love of your fellow man or, or that? Um, and again, I've had so many people to love me, to mentor me, that um, I thrive on the opportunity to do that through the land. Thank you, Kel. You mentioned leadership, and in the room we have uh, a few CEOs and, and uh, a few development officers and a few chief development officers. When you think of leadership in a nonprofit organization and you think of a CEO and you think of a development officer, what would some of the characteristics or attributes that you would like to see or have seen in, in those that you've enjoyed working with and that have been the most successful? I spend a lot of time trying to figure out what makes another person tick. <laughs> um, and um, leaders can come in all sorts of human packaging. Um, they can have uh, um, 
they're thought of as being extroverted. Uh, some of the best leaders I've known have, haven't been uh, an extrovert. By the way, in my Myers-Briggs testing, I'm just barely an extrovert. I'm, I'm pretty close to the line, and which uh, surprises people to learn that. Um, I'll, a leader is defined primarily about by, excuse me, defined primarily by um, a compelling personal mission. One that draws me in and draws others in to be a part of. A leader is someone who can who loves others. A leader is someone who truly listens. Now, that's one of the hardest things to do. But it is so easy for the other person to detect when I've stopped listening or you've stopped listening. Have you ever thought about what goes on facially when when somebody just stops listening? You can't say, but you, you know it when you see it, don't you? Uh oh the lights may be on, but nobody's at home. <laughs> it's just, it's stopped. Now, a true leader listens for what's going on in the other person. A true leader listens the other person into asking a better question. Asking the right question is so critical. And and I, as a leader, want to understand your best question that motivates you, the answer to that question. A leader's also someone who has a sense of humor. I, uh, I was glad to get a little bit of self-deprecating humor about me <laughs> out of the way. <laughs> 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 but to be able to laugh at yourself. A mature sense of humor is vital. And that's your ability to laugh at yourself. I've always tried to laugh at myself before somebody else does. <laughs> Thank you, Kel. Uh, you, we've got a wonderful community here in Middle Tennessee in Nashville. Yes. And, and you and your family have been a big part of that. And we got a room full of really talented, committed, caring fundraising professionals. What what can this group do? How can we, what's already a great situation, raise the bar? How can we increase the philanthropic culture of our community? Is there anything that, that can be done or that, that we as professionals could be better? What, what are your thoughts? Well, um, I don't. I don't presume to have a good answer for you there. It, it, it has to do with, um, with your life and your mission and your purpose. Um, as, as you pursue your mission in a way that inspires others to define theirs and to pursue it even better, then the um, overall engagement of the community uh, is enhanced. Um, everybody wants to be part of something that matters, I think. And to the extent the opportunity to be part of something that matters is offered, then the opportunity grows. Um, I hope you understand that you're already raising the, the level of philanthropy in our community and our region. You're doing that. Um, maybe you can enhance what you're doing 
by acknowledging um, how God's already at work in your doing. Um, that's that's wonderful. Now I will tell you, uh, I I want to tell you one of my favorite Cal Senior stories about my dad. I feel sorry for anybody who uh, didn't, didn't meet my dad, didn't know my dad. My dad lived in Scottsville, Kentucky. Um, oh, all he lived 85 years, and <clears throat> the last uh, 78 of it, I think, were in Scottsville, Kentucky. And um, my dad, my dad started off uh, in business saying, retailing is 24-7. You can't get engaged in the community. You can't even take time out to go to Rotary Club. You got to work, son. You got, you got to be in the store. You got to do that all the time, all the time. Then, as, as we got more strategic in the management of the company and started developing um, our human resources and and developing ourselves as a company, then we got more engaged in philanthropy. And my dad saw his, his kids uh, become philanthropic, mostly down here in Nashville. So he decided that he would conduct a survey and he found that there were 91 churches in Allen County, Kentucky. <laughs> 91 churches. And he gave $1,000 to each of those 91 churches. And he said, they were overwhelmed for, for more than half of those churches. That was the largest gift in their history. <laughs> he said, son, look how cheap philanthropy is. <laughs> you can't buy that kind of goodwill for $91,000 down there in Nashville. <laughs> and, and so, he, he, so he did it a second time. And I'll never forget um, a week before his death at his home in Scottsville. We were all there. Um, Flores made a delivery of 91 red roses to him. Um, that's impressive. Then, then he had us to go all over town, take some to this person, that person, to this church, that church, so we don't go to waste. Then about three days before my dad's death, I got him in for one last ride through his beloved Allen County, Kentucky. And he was lapsing into unconsciousness, not coma, but he was asleep most of the time. He was sleeping, I thought, and I was driving, and he raised up and said, turn here. There was a country road I'd never been down. Turned, he drove around, he came to a little church, and he said, son, I've lived in Allen County for more than 75 years. That church was here before I came. <clears throat> and that church will be here after I die. But while I was here, I had the joy of being part of its ministry. This is the same man at the beginning of my career who said, you can't get engaged in the community. You gotta work at the store or something. But he had the dimension of blessing of philanthropy. And you need to help others attain that blessing in their lives. Because it truly is a blessing. Cal, you are a, a gift to your family and to those that you've worked with and to so many organizations, and we appreciate your being a great gift and blessing to us this morning. Thank you so much.